Jane is learning a painful lesson about her cousin, Sinjin Rivers. For all his piety, he's a man who forgives but does not forget. Since refusing Sinjin's proposal of marriage, Jane has been frozen out of his affection. He really can be a cold, hard man. Imagine being married to him. Meanwhile, Sinjin seems kinder than usual towards his sisters, Diana and Mary. This is torture for Jane, so she makes another attempt to befriend him. It doesn't go well. He seems surprised that Jane still refuses to go to India with him as his wife. Jane tries to explain that if she married him, his coldness would kill her. In fact, it's killing her now. This offends Sinjin, and he soon figures out why Jane prefers to stay in London. She's still in love with Edward Rochester. Jane confesses. She must find out what's happened to him. Sinjin pities Jane and says he will pray for her redemption. Hey team, just a reminder, if you like this video, please hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell. It really helps the channel out and our next upload could be on something taught in your next class. Thanks and back to the video. Back inside, Diana asks Jane what's been going on between her and Sinjin. So Jane spills the beans. Sinjin's proposal, his plans for India, her refusal and her reasons. While Diana and Mary had secretly hoped that Jane and Sinjin would get together, Diana reassures Jane that she's done the right thing. At dinner, Sinjin is still civil to Jane. Then, at evening prayers, he reads from the Bible in a way that leaves her awestruck. After Diana and Mary go to bed, Sinjin speaks with Jane alone. He asks her to consider his proposal over the next two weeks while he's away in Cambridge. Sinjin speaks to Jane like she's a lost lamb and she begins to fall under his spell. His gentleness confuses her to the point where she begins to relent. Could marrying Sinjin be God's will? Jane asks heaven for guidance and feels a strange sensation. Then she hears a voice. It's Mr. Rochester calling her name, and he sounds like he's in terrible pain. Jane cries out that she's coming and runs outside to hear an answer. Sinjin follows her, but she breaks away from him. Jane's back in her own power now and knows what she needs to do. She returns to her room, locks the door, and waits for daybreak. At dawn, Sinjin slips a note under Jane's door as he leaves for Cambridge. It repeats his request for Jane to take the next two weeks to think about his proposal. But there's little chance of that now. After hearing Mr Rochester's voice, Jane is about to go on a mission of her own. That afternoon, Jane walks to the crossroads where she was dropped off a year ago. She also catches the same coach that left her there. 36 hours later, Jane is back in familiar territory and she walks the remaining few miles to Thornfield Hall. To her horror, all Jane finds is a blackened, burnt-out ruin. Thornfield Hall is no more. No wonder all her letters went unanswered. What on earth has happened here? And was anyone hurt? Jane heads back to the local inn, the Rochester Arms, to find out. According to the innkeeper, about a year ago, Bertha Mason, Mr Rochester's lunatic wife, started the fire. It was the dead of night and Bertha's guard, Mrs Poole, had drunk too much gin and fallen asleep. So Bertha took the keys from Mrs Poole's pocket, slipped out and started the blaze. Luckily, Adele had been sent to school by then and Mrs Fairfax retired, so Mr Rochester only needed to evacuate the servants. He then re-entered the burning building to save Bertha, who'd climbed onto the roof and was behaving wildly. But as Mr Rochester approached her, she leapt to her death. 
Thornfield was engulfed by then and partly collapsed as Mr Rochester was escaping. He lost an eye and a hand but was pulled alive from the burning wreckage. He's now blind and lives as a recluse at Ferndean Manor, his other house 30 miles away. The only people who live with him are John and Mary, two elderly servants from Thornfield. Jane tells the innkeeper to prepare the carriage. She must be at Ferndean by nightfall. Sure enough, Jane arrives just before sunset. She dismisses the carriage and walks the remaining mile up to the house. It's quite a desolate spot. The woods are so thick and dark that Jane begins to wonder if she's lost her way. Eventually, the decaying old manor comes into sight. What a far cry from the grandeur of Thornfield. As she approaches the house, a figure emerges. It's Mr Rochester. Jane stops in her tracks and watches him in silent awe. He looks much the same. His frame is still broad and strong, but his face shows signs of brooding melancholy. He looks up with his sightless eye and reaches out to touch the rain with his one good hand. He doesn't see Jane. After he goes back inside, Jane knocks on the door. It's answered by Mary, who's startled by Jane's sudden, random visit to Ferndean. Once inside, Jane assures John and Mary that it really is her. She reveals that she knows what happened at Thornfield and she's come to see Mr Rochester. Then the parlour bell rings, summoning Mary. Mr Rochester would like a glass of water and candles brought in. So Jane does the honours in Mary's stead. Of course, when she enters the parlour, old Pilot jumps up in excitement and nearly tips the tray over. When Jane speaks, Mr Rochester becomes wary of a stranger, then begins to realise who it might be. He reaches out in desperation. Is this just another cruel dream he's about to wake up from? Jane takes Mr Rochester's hand, kisses him and speaks to him. He pulls her in with passionate relief and it takes a while before he begins to accept that she's real. Things become more concrete when Jane shares the good news about her inheritance and newfound independence. She also promises Mr Rochester that she'll never leave him again so long as she lives. Here, he becomes solemn and overwhelmed by doubt. How can he expect Jane to stay and wait on him, disfigured and helpless as he is? How will she ever love him now? But as far as Jane is concerned, the only danger is that she'll love him too much now that he's so vulnerable and needy. Jane comforts him by bustling about, organising his dinner and chatting with him like old times. The following day, Jane and Mr Rochester go for a long walk outside. It's a beautiful summer day and Jane enjoys describing everything to him. She then finds them a comfortable place to sit and perches herself on his knee. Jane now decides to tell him what's happened to her this past year, but skips over the starvation and begging. No need to stress the poor guy out. She tells him about Morehouse, the school, her surprise inheritance, and the stunning revelation that the River's siblings are her cousins. St John's name frequently comes up and Mr Rochester becomes jealous. So jealous, in fact, that he asks Jane to get off his knee. She refuses, of course, because she's comfy there and he's being silly. Jane explains that St John may be young and handsome, but he's as cold as ice. He'd propose to Jane not because he loves her, but because he thought she'd be useful to him in India. The truth is and always has been, that Jane's heart belongs to Edward Rochester. With this renewed hope, Mr Rochester proposes marriage to Jane, and she immediately accepts. Although he makes her say yes multiple times before he's satisfied that her answer is genuine. And so, three days later, they marry. It's a simple, private ceremony, 
and the news is received by John and Mary with gentle congratulations. Jane writes immediately to Morehouse and Cambridge to tell her cousins what's happened. Diana and Mary shoot back a joyful reply and make plans to visit the newlyweds as soon as possible. Sinjin, however, takes his time. When he finally does write to Jane, six months later, he doesn't mention anything about her marriage. His letters are kind, but not frequent, and always remind Jane to live in devotion to God. Jane also goes to visit little Adele as a priority. When she finds her school too harsh, Jane moves her to a more suitable one nearby. Adele grows up to be a fine young Englishwoman and a marvellous companion for Jane. Over the next ten years, Jane and Edward Rochester continue in marital bliss. It takes two years for him to regain the sight in his right eye. He recovers just in time to see that his firstborn son has inherited his big black eyes. As for Jane's cousins, both Diana and Mary make good matches, but Sinjin never marries. He goes to India as planned and carries out his mission with astonishing bravery and dedication. Sadly, after 10 years, Sinjin becomes seriously ill and Jane is certain that he won't live long. However, she takes comfort in her belief that Sinjin is among those whom God has chosen for paradise. And that's the story of Jane Eyre. Or should we say Mrs Jane Eyre Rochester? Long may she reign among literature's most famous heroines. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.